whether you're a rusty pilot or a new pilot, learning the land's not easy. And I'm going to take you through my journey this time out from about hour zero to hour 40. In the process, there were some doozies like that. Before we got back to where we were IFR competent and just cruising around, pretty much fearless single pilot IFR. You know, when you get into flying, you're thinking about getting out and taking adventures and going places. And by about hour 40 or 50, I was back up to speed and I was traveling and I was traveling like I am right here in this short video. But before that, before putting people in and going places, there was a lot of learning that had to go on. And I would say it was harder as an old man to get in there and unlearn bad habits and coming back and maybe thinking you knew a little bit more about it than what you did to get back to traveling and having all these wonderful experiences that you'd like to have in aviation. So let's look back at about hour zero to hour 10 and we'll get to circling around hot springs. Now I ran out and bought a trainer, an old Sierra that I had uh, flown when I was in flight school at Henderson State back in the 80s. Great plane, sturdy plane, but uh, a lot of the local flight instructors didn't know how to fly, really none of them. So we had a lot of experiences before we learned the numbers much like you would in the uh, Beechcraft course. And we flew around and we flew around a little bit fast and we flew around with a little bit too much power. And God, there was a lot to getting to where this plane would actually land. But thank goodness for all the guys that stuck in there with me. And let's look at the first day out. My it was cold, we didn't know a whole lot. But Luke and I got in the airplane, and just like any brave young man building time, he let the old man try to kill him. We knew the V-speeds, we knew what we needed to be doing, and Luke had a bunch of time, so here we went. You know, when you first get back in, you're, you're unsure of flows and checklists and all that, so there's a little bit of needing a... Um, need a helping hand, needing somebody to watch over you. So, certainly grateful to everybody that's going to be in this video trying to help us out. But, not necessarily a landing, but a takeoff. I'll speed it up to get it back around here for my, what's got to be my third or fourth landing ever in this plane. What the internet had said about these planes was they needed to have a little bit of power left in them to land them. And, that never worked for me. Um, I think if I was instructing somebody how to land this plane, we'd shut it off over the numbers. I, I had better luck with that later on. But my bad carom out in Dallas was directly responsible for that. Like, there was just too much power left on. I was so scared about not getting the gear down. You'll hear me in all these videos call out gumps a hundred times. looking at it we've actually got a decent approach going with about 400 foot a minute down there but we're fast we're 80 knots we probably need to be 70 over the numbers and if you look there at the rpm gauge rpms are too high we need all the power out but we're gonna land this daggum thing with 1800 rpms Oh, God help us. But we carried on and we continued on. Luke got to ride around that pattern a whole bunch of times while we were trying not to kill ourselves. But time and repetition get you to where you want to go because eventually you're going to figure it out. If you look right there, we've, we're going to get... 500 feet a minute established at some point, hopefully, but we're still a little fast. We're coming down at about 700 feet a minute. Starting to bleed off some of the speed, getting a little bit better at looking all the way down the runway. 
speed's going down, power's out. You know, we bounced right there too. Just felt like there's a, a whole lot of bounces in learning how to do this, but not giving up. By Christmas, which was not that long, maybe 20, 30 hours into this at this point, I felt like I was far enough along to go get that plane out by myself on Christmas Day and fly it down to my parents. And it went fine, and we had two good landings, one on the way down and one on the way up. But we're not going to be able to see the dash right here. And I've got some other video of that dash footage, but we're still carrying a little bit of power. And if it had been windy or gusty, it probably would have made us carry them. So we would have got down. But when you look back with the super critical look, you're, and you're honest with yourself, you're like, mm, we were still kind of dangerous there. But you're not gonna get undangerous by not flying, and you can't always have somebody in there. You're just gonna have to work through your own mistakes. But that got a little bit of confidence, and maybe 15, 20 days later, the family had talked me into coming out to Dallas. And we were gonna land in Rockwall because it was an uncontrolled field on the edge of the Bravo. It's about 45 feet wide, it's maybe about 3,500 feet long. Well, Hot Springs is 6,500 feet. Magnolia, Arkansas is 5,000 feet. Adjusting to that site picture of that super narrow runway with I'm assuming I probably had 20 to 40 hours somewhere in that window. It was a total mind job rolling in there. I had uh, VFR flight following. They had handed me off. We had picked up Unicom and come in. But if you look, we are falling out of the sky there at 700 feet a minute. That's too much. The speeds are not nailed, and we're going to end up short. We're gonna actually end up uh, in the um, displaced threshold. That was a sobering moment. Let me tell you, I came home and said, no mosque, we are not doing that, and got a whole bunch of different pilots in that airplane and just kept flying, kept learning, not gonna give up. So with that, I started flying with, you know, everybody in my network that I knew, a lot of the jet pilots, and we just got out there and burned a hole in the sky. I finally got in with some guys that realized that we could figure out numbers on any airplane, and once we did that, boy, life-changing moments started happening because you could get the plane down anywhere with some confidence. But um, I kept somebody in there with me for a while because that one bad landing had really broken my confidence on the way back. And getting over that was a big deal. Those landings might be a little bit carrier style, but it didn't matter. You know, we could get to up and get down and land in some crosswind. And, and we're safe, you know, this excited to be out there and excited to start going, but still cautious. At this point, we had bought an A1B Grumman trainer from my oldest boy to learn in. And me and Gunner got in there and started figuring it out uh, ahead of them flying. And what a great great experience to get back in a small plane it's the size of a 152 but a lot of learning moments and I'd say it helped me as I um, was flying different stuff and you just had to get used to the energy in the planes again and flying way more outside because in those original landings that heads down it's looking at air speeds and stuff and you really need to be outside closer to the ground and just feeling the energy of the, of the plane and trusting yourself. 
All these moments and all this training was leading to something that I needed to get to, which was flying the planes by myself and trusting myself enough to put the family back in there. Flying to Dallas had been a real, real shattering moment where flying to home to my mom and dad's on Christmas had been a confidence building moment. At this point, I started going to the airport and just getting out in the airplane and flying to the other local airports who were maybe 20 to 40 minutes away. Practicing what I'd learned, which was airspeed control in flying the numbers and flying the power settings. Because that's a revolutionary part in this. You know, flying a 172, everybody knows the numbers, everybody knows the power settings. Being this plane that nobody knew anything about held me back for a little while. But once we did that, I started traveling. Started feeling a lot of confidence. We installed an autopilot in the airplane. I would say the autopilot took me away from hand flying a little bit too much initially. I mean, it was just so great. Um, you might as well have owned a, a Cirrus at that point where you could turn it on a thousand foot off the ground and it would fly you anywhere. Real cautious in the new V-tail that I fly it by hand. If you look here compared to the earlier parts of the videos, we've got 500 feet a minute nailed up. 80 knots is still uh, 78, we're too fast over the fence there, but I'm gonna start getting that power all the way out. Hold it off, hold it off, hold it off. There you go. It doesn't look smooth, but you're there. <laughs> you know, do I have 1500 hour touch? No, but I was, I was out and I was moving around safely and I was ready to put the family back in and go places. With that, I started putting my oldest boy who was started flight training and the little grumman in the plane with me a lot more. And we started moving around and we started having a lot of father-son moments that, you know, here's me at the end of my life, I'll treasure that stuff. And uh, that child's working on going zero to ATP right now. He's ready for an instrument check ride and it's just, Life is about experiences, man. It's about getting out here with your family and your friends and doing some stuff and creating some memories. And uh, we have sold a lot of our possessions off to be able to get out and fly and go. And I don't regret a minute of it. Um, I know at the end of my life, I'll think back about all this flying I've done versus owning some big house that I hated to clean and I sure hated the electric bill home. <laughs> Right here, again, you know, 500 feet a minute, 80 knots pegged up, you know, got a good controlled descent into the airport. This is on the shorter side, facing the mountains and coming over a stack of trees with confidence. Um, con controlled, stable approach when you're coming back is the biggest thing. If I could give out one piece of advice is figure out what those numbers are and get used to that. There we go. Just getting out and uh, you know, experiencing life. But the plane was bought for really one thing in mind and that was work. Because my work is all over the place. It's spread across several different states. And just being back to where you were flying around with confidence and getting from meeting to meeting a whole lot faster and covering a whole lot more ground, really big deal. So we come into Jonesboro, Arkansas here. This would be the last one. At this point, I had gotten my instrument rating back and man could just go in any place with a whole lot of confidence and it was invigorating 
in some coming videos, I'll take you through some of the trips and just the bigger life experiences, but being able to get around for work and be able to go from Jonesboro, Arkansas to Corpus Christi or Galveston in a day and make meetings in both. That's a, that's a big deal for the traveling salesman and just uh, your quality of life and spending more nights at the house in your bed versus a hotel's bed. Um, I'd hate to tell you what kind of Marriott points I've got because I spend way too much time on the road. <laughs> Getting to where you can just come into any unfamiliar airport like this, nail it up and get down. Here we are on the numbers, 500 feet a minute. We're going to let this one take us on into the house. Appreciate everyone tuning in and listening this long. Smash the like and subscribe. I don't ask that a whole bunch, but the channel's real close to getting monetized. And, um, you know, we've got a whole new panel. $120,000 worth of gear going into the VTEL. Going to be adding some partners where we've got a few more people owning it. And the adventures in the big ride will be on.